Hello, Compassionistas. Welcome back to Compassion in a T-shirt, where I discuss all things compassion and self-compassion. I do weekly videos, sometimes interviewing therapists or researchers about their work in compassion or doing a piece to camera like this video today. So if you find this stuff useful, please like this video, share with others and subscribe to my channel. Today we're going to delve into the role emotions play in compassion and their profound impact on compassionate decision making and action. There's an intricate and delicate dance between our feelings and the choices we make. And sometimes, believe it or not, our apparent compassion can do more harm than good. But there's a lot of nuance to this, so let's get started. I've been trying out other podcasts lately, just to get a range of inputs into my thinking, and recently listened to Chris Williamson's Modern Wisdom podcast, episode number 723, 15 Lessons from 2023. In that episode, he described how pleased he was to have come up with the concept toxic compassion. According to Williamson, Toxic compassion is the prioritization of short-term emotional comfort over everything else, over truth, reality, actual long-term outcomes, flourishing, everything. It optimizes for looking good rather than doing good. He gave several examples. Here's a couple. He said, people would rather claim that body fat has no bearing on health and mortality outcomes to avoid making overweight people feel upset, even if this causes them to literally die sooner and have a worse quality of life over the long run. And he said, parents would rather allow children to play computer games or watch screens and access social media every night instead of dealing with the discomfort of taking it away from them even if it ruins their brain development, social skills, and self-esteem. And there were other examples too. But then he went on to say that the key in all of this is the trade-off between appearing good and doing good. Others have talked about similar ideas. Jordan Peterson talked about how an excess of compassion is destructive on the Origins podcast with Lawrence M. Krauss from around December 2021. So are they right? Is compassion toxic and destructive, or at least can it be? If we look at the two examples I've mentioned from Chris Williamson, whether you agree with them or not, they are actually quite different and offer different insights, but they highlight the role that emotions can play in our compassionate decision-making and actions. Emotions, the powerful forces that are at play throughout our lives, have a significant role in shaping our decisions and actions, including when it comes to compassion. On the one hand, they can be the driving force behind acts of kindness and helpfulness, while on the other, they may lead to impulsive or misguided choices. Let's unpack both sides of this emotional coin. So the positive side. Emotions often serve as signals, guides and drivers of our compassion. First, empathy allows us to connect with others on a deep emotional level, alerting us to the experiences or suffering of others. When we feel the pain of someone else, it sparks a desire to take action and make a positive difference in their lives. This is affective empathy. Empathy also helps us understand them, their perspective and their situation, as well as what they might need to alleviate their suffering or what might be helpful. This is cognitive empathy. Second, sympathy can lead to feelings of concern or sorrow for the person who may be suffering. We feel emotionally moved or touched by their suffering, and that can help motivate us to do something to help. Imagine if we were to see suffering, but not feel moved at all 
by what the person is going through. In such a scenario, it would be very unlikely that we would feel motivated to help. We might even empathize with their situation, but without sympathy, we are less likely to take compassionate action. Just think about the last time you felt motivated to take compassionate action, whether it was helping a loved one, a stranger in need, or getting involved in a community coming together during challenging times. What were the emotional aspects to the decision you made to help and the actions you took? Commonly, these kinds of actions are fueled by the genuine emotions of care and concern, sometimes sorrow, sometimes righteous anger. Lots of different emotions can offer a positive driving force behind compassion. While emotions can be a positive force for compassionate decision making and action, they also come along with their challenges. Sometimes our feelings can cloud our judgment and lead us down paths that might not be in the best interests of others or ourselves. Returning to Chris Williamson's examples, perhaps these challenges can arise in different ways. Williamson's first example is that people might neglect the notion that body fat is related to health outcomes to avoid upsetting overweight people, despite the real risks of poorer long-term outcomes. I'll come back to discuss this specific example in a few moments. But one way empathy or sympathy and the emotions that go along with them might lead to unhelpful, compassionate decision-making or action is when we feel concerned about upsetting someone or causing them distress and therefore avoid the more helpful course of action. Another example might be that we don't take our child to the dentist because they're afraid of the dentist and the idea of going upsets them. Years pass, their oral health deteriorates and eventually they need much more significant dental care that is more painful and costly than it might have otherwise been. Our efforts to reduce suffering in the short term have resulted in more suffering in the long term. Now, it's our emotions arising out of empathy and or sympathy that have caused us to take action that is possibly less effective in the long term. That is avoidance. However, it's interesting to note that our emotions here are still telling us something important. And that is the child is upset and this needs to be managed, but managed wisely. Perhaps we talk with the child and soothe them, validating their fears. Perhaps we try to encourage them. Perhaps we work out a way to gradually expose them to going to the dentist so they can feel less anxious and more confident about it. Perhaps we reward them or work out a way to positively reinforce them after going or having little achievements towards their dental health journey. If you're interested in this topic of dental anxiety amongst children, have a look at a 2017 review paper by Seligman and others in Clinical Psychology Review. I've put a link to the paper in the description below. So you see, our emotions still guide us regarding compassion. It's just that we try to think it through and move towards compassionate action that is wise and skillful. Williamson's example is a similar thing. We know that there's a lot of stigma and shame about weight, size and body image. We know that people are often shamed by well-meaning health professionals who tell them they need to lose weight to not die early. And so again, the emotions arising from our empathy and sympathy about not wanting to upset the person we're trying to help can still guide us so as to not avoid the whole thing and ignore the problem, but to find wise, skillful ways to help. For example, the health at every size approach tries to do this. The main components of the Hayes approach are intuitive eating, body acceptance, regardless of size or shape, 
and physical activity for movement and health rather than for performance or to shape the body. Through this approach, people can learn to eat more intuitively again, understanding their own body, their sensations of hunger or feeling sated, and make choices that feel right for them. They can also develop body acceptance, reducing feelings of self-consciousness and shame, and even appreciate their own body and how it helps them to make their way in the world. Shame can have such a negative effect on our choices across a wide range of domains, and reducing shame is very important. And finally, once a person is managing their eating intuitively and having greater acceptance and appreciation of their own body, the Hayes approach would encourage physical movement, activity, and appropriate exercise that is individualized and less about competitive motivations and more about health and well-being. If you're interested in this topic, then you can find a link to a 2015 article by Penny and Kirk that offers a careful look at the empirical evidence around the Hayes approach. So we can do both. We can be guided by our emotions and act wisely and skillfully to help. It sometimes takes a bit more thought and consideration. And it also takes what we might call distress tolerance. That is our ability to manage our own distress in order to calmly identify what truly is most helpful. But we can certainly find the sweet spot between avoidance and trying to force or even shame people into change. Chris Williamson's second example, not getting kids off social media because of the discomfort it might cause us, is slightly different. Where the first example involved situations where we feel concern about upsetting the other person, the person we're trying to help, the second example is about situations where taking action to help others may cause discomfort to ourselves. There are a lot of cases where our emotions might inhibit our compassion in this kind of way. Donating to charities might feel uncomfortable financially. Volunteering might feel uncomfortable in terms of the time it takes. Helping someone in the street may feel uncomfortable because they might react badly or make a scene. And yes, being on the receiving end of whinging or complaining or yelling or slamming doors or even being told, I hate you, can cause the kind of discomfort that puts us off intervening with our kids' social media use, even though we know spending a lot of time on social media can cause them greater suffering, especially with respect to mental health. Jonathan Haidt and his colleagues especially Jean Twenge, have written about the mental health effects of social media. For more information on this topic, you can go to Professor Haight's website or to a 2022 paper by Twenge, Haight and others. I've put both links in the description. What all this really indicates is that compassionate action is difficult, often involves discomfort, and even sacrifice. Living a good life is not the same as living a life that always feels good. I spoke above about the importance of wisdom when it comes to compassionate decision-making and action. And this second example highlights the importance of strength and courage. Compassion takes a lot of courage. After all, compassion is about approaching suffering and trying to help. It will often invoke difficult emotions, such as anxiety, sadness, frustration, and so on. We need to try to create in ourselves feelings of calmness, strength, confidence, courage, and a commitment to try to help wisely, skillfully, to alleviate suffering. These are the qualities we focus on and develop when we're working towards cultivating a compassionate mind in compassion-focused therapy, wisdom, strength and courage, and a commitment to being caring, supportive, encouraging, and helpful. 
So, how do we navigate the intricate interplay between emotions and compassionate action? Here are a few strategies to strike a balance. Mind awareness and insight. Being aware of our own minds and our own emotions in any given moment understanding the function of these emotions and stepping out of autopilot and instead finding a way to manage the emotions and respond wisely and skillfully rather than react impulsively. Wisdom and wise action really is the key here. Fine tuning our empathy and sympathy. We want to be able to connect with competencies such as empathy and sympathy. And we want to really practice and fine tune these skills. Practicing perspective taking and distress tolerance can help us understand others' emotions and needs more effectively and manage our own difficult emotions. Strength and courage. Compassion takes a lot of courage. It's the first of all virtues as it guarantees all the others. That's a quote from Aristotle. It goes something like that. It's certainly true of compassion and we can build courage by layering a foundation of strength, groundedness, stability and calmness. All of this takes a bit of work, especially working with the body, the physical state, slowing and settling, finding solid ground. In conclusion, emotions wield a tremendous influence over our compassionate decision-making and actions. When harnessed positively, they become a driving force for caring, supportive, helpful action. However, it's crucial to be mindful of the potential pitfalls and strive for a balanced approach in navigating the complex landscape of emotions. Our emotions can get in the way of compassion. Not that compassion itself becomes toxic, but more that compassion is difficult, emotional, and takes a lot of wherewithal to find our way through all of that. Thank you for joining me today on Compassion in a T-shirt. Don't forget to like this video, share it with your friends, and leave your thoughts in the comments below. What do you think about toxic compassion? Until next time, keep practicing compassion.